George, even despite the uh, current set to over uh, the FAA's funding crisis and so forth, there's still tremendous talk and tremendous discussions going on regardless about our fuel future. Um, there's a, well, let's face it, there's a fair amount of snake oil, there's a fair amount of doubt, there's a fair amount of fear, and there's a lot of uncertainty. Correct. You folks have been working on this for quite a while. Tell us about your solution to the problem. Well, our solution to the problem was to do what the industry had not done for the last 20-something years. And that was to simply find a fuel that works and then write a specification around that fuel. That's very different than what the industry and the FAA had been trying to do for some 20-some-odd years. It really came down to an interesting comment that was made by uh, Michael Kraft, the chief operating officer of uh, Lycoming right now. And uh, his comment that he made here at Oshkosh a year ago was, hey guys, we've got to quit loving this problem and just fix it. It's the essence of what's got to be done. So our solution was, uh, was this. Is we came back from AOPA very discouraged in the fall of 2009 because we were convinced that the EPA was going to do exactly what they promised everybody that they were going to do, which was to come out with the notice of proposed rulemaking. And we looked down the road and could tell that that was going to crater the decision-making in general aviation and cast a dark shadow over people's purchasing decisions, not only for engines, but for engine upgrades and even for glass panel stuff. You know, high ticket items were just, sales were going to take a huge hit because the EPA was going to cre create exactly what you said, the FUD, the fear, uncertainty, and doubt, and it was going to hang over the market. And so we took a deep breath and said, we really need to change the way this is done. We need to just find a fuel that works and then go write a specification around the fuel that works. We had a, an idea for uh, how to do this. We came back, we tried it. It worked awfully well to the point that we didn't believe it. We kept trying it, it appeared to work. We went to work, uh, flanged up the intellectual property part of it, filed an application for an STC with the FAA. So we picked an engine that was clearly a hard, difficult, worst case engine, which would be a high compression, normally aspirated engine. And then we put a turbocharger on top of it. That just happened to fit our existing STC for the turbonormalized Cirrus. And because we owned that STC, we could put in to amend that STC. Well, it was a great game plan, except it got frustrated by some people uh, that got assigned to the project in the FAA, and it continued to get frustrated for 16 months. To her everlasting credit, Dorinda Baker, in March of this year, agreed to relook at the problem, and after she did, she uh, reshuffled the deck. She ordered that the first restart meeting on the certification effort take place in her conference room at 800 Independence Avenue in Washington. And I've got to tell you, that was like a breath of fresh air. Uh, all of the obstructions that had previously existed literally disappeared that day. Uh, and we've been making uh, awfully good progress since then. And frankly, neither I nor so far as I know any of the FAA people working the project see any uh, showstoppers at this point. We've got a set of push-ups we need to do so we're headed down that path as fast as we can pedal. Uh, it's still going to take some time and some and some effort. And you know, we run a company that got 50 employees and several different product lines, and and uh, all of us have limited resources and, and whatnot. But that's uh, that's our uh, on our short list of our highest priorities is to pursue this fuel project. Welcome to the Aero News Network, the aviation world's most comprehensive news and information resource. Real-time, 24-7 online audio and video programming, where aviation has been getting updated for over a decade. Distributing over 11,000 stories, features, audio and video programs every year, only ANN covers aviation and aerospace with this much depth, insight and expertise. Check us out on the web at aero-news.net. Should you see success with the FAA from the standpoint of an approval, how can you put together the, the obvious next step, getting it into production, getting it distributed? That's got to be a bear and a half. Well, in theory it is, but in practice it shouldn't be. And here's why. Um, we don't want to be in the fuel business at all. Smart, smart man. Yeah, I mean, it's just that's a, just that's a, we don't want to be in the fuel business. Uh, what we want is for there to be a visible solution that's workable and by workable it means it has to work in the airplane and it has to work in the pocketbook and there's been a loss of focus on the pocketbook side of this at this point in time personally i have no doubt that the fuel is workable technically 
And I have, frankly, no doubt that this fuel is workable economically. And it's got to end up being a fuel that's priced somewhere close to existing 100 low lead. All of the components that are in the G100 UL fuel are components that are readily available in large quantities. And it's made in such volumes that if you take up the necessary quantities to support uh, the entire general aviation piston fleet on an annual basis, it won't disrupt the, the, the market uh, stream or the existing supply chain uh, on those items that are out there. And one of the great beauties of this is that right now there's only seven to nine places in, in the United States that make 100 low lead. And that's largely because there's only seven to nine places that still have the old lead handling equipment in place or that have replaced it in modern times when it got old so that they're still capable of making 100 low lead. But the beauty of this fuel is, as an example I like to use, is eight Oklahoma's off in the boondocks in southeastern Oklahoma. It's a lovely place to raise a family, by the way. But within 42 miles of eight Oklahoma, there are two refineries. There's one at Winniewood, which is 28 miles away or something, and one at Ardmore, a total refinery that's 42 miles away. Either one of those refineries, those small, medium-sized refineries, can make G100UL. Uh, they could make it next month if they wanted to. So the point is that there are lots of places that can make it. That tends to reduce the transportation costs. Because, for example, right now the fuel in our little town in 8, Oklahoma, comes from places like Borger, Texas, which is a long ways away, or Kansas, which is a long ways away, or Houston, which is further away. Uh, and so those, those, you know, those last mile transportation costs are expensive on these fuels. And having the fuel made in more places gives us more price competition and less transportation costs on the fuel. Abadine is the brand of choice for pilots who want innovative, easy to use avionics. And the new IFD 540 GPS Navcom sets a new standard for simplicity in communication and LPV navigation. As a slide-in replacement for existing 530 series navigators, and with a highly intuitive touchscreen control, the IFD 540 makes it much easier to access the information you want when you want it, reducing head downtime and making flying more enjoyable. Finally, you have a choice, and the choice is easy. Avidine. Do we have a reasonable estimate at this point of how this is going to cost out in the end run? Yeah, I am willing to say that every number I've seen uh, says that this fuel is going to cost about what 100 low lead costs. It'll be close to it. Everybody immediately wants to know what the word close means. And my concept of close is on the neighborhood of 5 to 10 percent close. That's what I think it looks like. I think those numbers are supportable by research. Others have done some of that research and pretty much agreed with it. I think the real problem is there's no real reason for the major petroleum companies to change the status quo. But if there's a fuel that's approved on an SDC that's workable, then all of a sudden there's known technology that's economically feasible and the powers that be in the environmental world are going to say our mandate from Congress is to use the best available technology. And if it's available and it's economical, then we're required by law to mandate it. And so I think that's the way to get rid of the lethargy in this whole process. So what's the drawback to all this? I don't know what any of the drawbacks are, okay. but what I do know is that there's some real positive benefits because as everybody knows, when we got the lead out of car engines, we started going you know, 100,000 miles on a change of spark plugs instead of 7,000 miles or 15,000 miles. Getting the lead out of the engines will do a lot for the engines in terms of uh, maintenance costs uh, with the engines. So there's some real positive payback for having an, an unleaded fuel to work in the engines. One other positive payback, and that is that it opens up some simplified engine control uh, algorithms because without the lead you can use the traditional oxygen sensors in the exhaust system that cannot presently be used. So it, you know, technologically it's an advance that we need. Uh, it's good for the engine. It's probably good for uh, future improvements in engine control systems. Uh, and it's time we do it. George, I, I know you folks have put some great work into all this. Uh, my own exposure to you folks from the standpoint of my ownership of my G3 Turbo has been an outstanding experience. If your prognostications about your fuel project meet what you've done so far and what I've been able to prove for myself, you'll have a winner, and we look forward to seeing it. Thank, Thank you, sir. Appreciate it.